Montana Ag Live is made possible by the Montana Department of Agriculture, the MSU Extension Service, the MSU Ag Experiment Stations of the College of Agriculture, the Montana Wheat and Barley Committee, the Montana Bankers Association, Cashman Nursery and Landscaping, the Gallatin Gardeners Club, and the Rocky Mountain Certified Crop Advisor Program. Good evening and welcome to Montana Ag Live, brought to you from the PBS studio at Montana State University in beautiful Bozeman, Montana. So my name is Nina Zydak, I am the director of the Seed Potato Certification Program and I'm going to be monitoring the program tonight. And in Montana Ag Live, this, this is your opportunity to ask any question that you might have about your home or garden or also about your um, agricultural operation. Um, we've assembled a great panel here tonight and we're going to have the opportunity to talk about those usual things and we're also going to have a chance to learn a little bit more about uh, Montana's most important work animal, which is the horse and the nutrition um, and research that is supporting um, nutritional aspects of, of horse management and um, also um, talk about everything else that we usually get the opportunity to visit with on Montana Egg Live about our gardens and what's going on in our fields at this time of year. So I'm gonna start off by introducing our panel. Um, on the far end, we have Mary Burrows, who is a uh, extension plant pathologist and also serves as the associate director of the Montana Egg Experiment Station. We have Amanda Bradbury. Uh, she is an equine nutritionist in the College of Agriculture, Animal Science, and she's gonna be talking to us today. Um, again, like I said, our most important um, agricultural animal, which is, or ex work animal, <laughs> which is the horse, and also a very, very important uh, animal for companionship and recreation. So uh, we have Lori Kurzinik, who is an insect diagnostician in the Scudder Disease Diagnostic Lab, and Abby Saeed, who is a horticulturalist here at MSU. Um, answering phones tonight, we have Cheryl Bennett with us in the studio, and we also have Deanna Midland, who is answering phones remotely, and she'll be sending them in to me in the studio so I can uh, see them and get them out to the panel. Um, we also have questions coming in on Facebook, so if you follow Montana Ag Live on Facebook, just go ahead and put your question in there and we'll make sure that we get to it. So, um, first of all tonight, I would just like to go to Amanda and give her the opportunity to talk a little bit about her um, program here at MSU. Well, thank you. First of all, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and, and answer some questions for all of you out there that may be wondering uh, little things about your horses and how we can optimize their management. Um, but I am an assistant professor of equine science at Montana State University in the Department of Animal and Range Science. I hold both a teaching and research appointment. Uh, my research focuses primarily on nutrition and physiology, diving into growth and development and how we can increase performance longevity of these horses, whether they're being used for work on the ranch or their show horses um, that we want to be able to show for a few years longer before we send them into the breeding herd or retire them to a new life. Okay, great. Thank you, Amanda. I'm sure we're gonna be coming to a lot more questions um, about horses. So. Um, Abby, uh, when should people uh, quit watering their shrubs and trees in their lawn this fall? That's a good question. I like to tell people to continue watering their trees and shrubs um, as long as you can until the ground freezes. So um, if you've shut off your irrigation system and you have some tender woody ornamentals, ones that struggled over the past couple of winters, I would say continue to hand water them once or twice a month until the ground freezes. Um, that, that'll set them up to survive winter um, or equip them with the best chances to survive winter. Do you okay. want to talk a little bit about where to water them? Yeah, that's a good yeah, that's a good question. Where to water them? So a lot of people think you just put the water right at the base of the trunk, but where most of the roots are is along the drip line. So where you see the canopy of the tree below it, um, the roots are going to be kind of a mirror of what the top looks like. And so um, applying that water around the drip line um, is going to be the best way to get that moisture to your trees and shrubs. 
Great, yeah. I mean, I think everybody is thinking about that right now. We know we need to turn the water off, but it is so dang dry. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's a, kind of a, an interesting it fall. Is. Yes. So, um, Lori, this is a question from Bozeman. Uh, the box elder bugs are really bad around their house this year. Is there anything that they can do for them? Yes, I actually brought some fox elder bugs today. I don't know if these will show up very well on the camera, but we've had a lot of questions about box elder bugs in the last couple of weeks. And when we have a heavy seed year, uh, the, the, the uh, box elder bugs feed on the seeds of uh, the female trees. And so we've had a lot of box elder bugs this year, even starting into June. So uh, the, the best thing you could do is really just use a shop vac to, to, to take care of them. But you can also, if you can, they're resistant to a lot of insecticides but you can mm -hmm. use something like an insecticidal soap and you can catch them. They're usually on the south and southwest facing sides of the house in the, any of the sunny areas. So uh, anything like that, uh, first yeah, try to try the vacuum and then, uh, and then just remember if they do come inside that they, they do not reproduce indoors, which it might seem like they, they do, but uh, they also stain fabric, so try not to smash them on, on any of your, your white curtains or anything like that. So there's no real silver bullet to take care of them, but if you can catch a bunch of them with a contact insecticide, then, then that's something that will work. But I, I use the shop vac or just... And they're seasonal they're and seasonal. they're annoying for a while and yeah. then they go away. Yep. <laughs> so, um, so for Amanda, um, this is a question that came in from Bozeman. Um, is it better for a horse with er early arthritis to be in a pasture or in a stall? That's a great question and actually is, is fairly complicated in the reasoning behind its answer. Um, but it's always better to have horses turned out. Um, and particularly because of the way the joint functions. What arthritis is, is a degradation of the cartilage within the joint. And when that cartilage degrades, there's really no way to reverse that. All we can do is slow down the progression of that arthritis and make that horse comfortable. So in an early onset osteoarthritis or early stages of osteoarthritis, it is good to have those horses out and moving, particularly because there's no vasculature within the joint itself. So it relies very heavily on the exchange between the synovial fluid, which actually lubricates the joint and the vasculature outside and increasing movement can actually improve that exchange from vasculature to the synovial fluid itself. And the synovial fluid is ultimately what feeds that cartilage. And so we can remove the bad stuff more efficiently and bring in some good stuff more efficiently when there is encouraged movement. So confinement housing does present some challenges from an arthritis perspective. So really, horses are no different than people. Absolutely. <laughs> As we true. age and get that little bit of arthritis. <laughs> You're exactly right. It's, it's best to keep moving. Yes. <laughs> so, so for Mary, um, so uh, this person's carrot leaves are bushy, yellow, and purple. Um, the roots have a lot of root hairs on them too. Is this a nutrient issue or is this a disease? Well, if it was a nutrient issue, all of the carrots would probably have it and they could get a soil test to figure mm -hmm. it out. Um, there is a disease called aster yellows that causes very similar symptoms. And another diagnostic thing you can do is wash that carrot off. And if it's bitter, mm -hmm. that is often associated with the phytoplasma. And that's comes in on leaf hoppers. Some years it's bad, some years you won't see it. Um, and that's can't do much about it at this yeah, point. Yeah, and they're also kind of woody and... Yeah. Yeah, and so I have an interesting observation about carrots this year, and you can weigh in on it. Um, so I had quite a few that are actually blooming this year. Mm. And, you know, they're a biennial, and so they shouldn't bloom the first year that you seed them, but I'm just wondering if it was the stress, because oh, it was know. really, really cold, and then it was really, really hot. Mm -hmm. I mean, does that make sense to you guys? Maybe. My de the deer got mine a couple times, so I'm not having that problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's kind of weird. It's kind of weird. And I had a couple of beets that also threw up, you know, flew up flower stocks too. So I'm, I'm thinking, I'm attributing it to stress. I, I <laughs> We've all that. been under stress this year. Um, so Abby, is it too late to do a fall fertilizer application for a lawn? Um, it's actually not too late to do a fall fertilizer application for your lawn. You can usually do your last application until about Columbus Day. Uh, you generally want to aim for about four weeks before the ground freezes, so um, you can still apply um, your last fertilizer treatment um, in the next couple of weeks. And I seem to remember kind of a rule of thumb that you can do three fertilizer applications during the summer, but the most important one is in the fall. Absolutely, yeah, so that sets your, sets your turf up for a successful 
following spring. Great. Great. Do you know too if you're if you have to apply an herbicide, is it is there a application first or your weed up? So it, it depends, but if you're doing um, a weed and feed, um, you can you can usually apply it together for um, a pre emergent um, for crabgrass and things like that. Um, but yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, Lori, a question came in from Fort Benton. Um, they're still seeing grasshoppers out. How long will they be around and what are they going to be like next year? Yeah, we've had a, another bad grasshopper year, so I, it's grasshoppers will be out till we have a, a really hard frost. We did have a hard frost, we had a frost, but it wasn't a very hard frost, so we'll probably see, we'll keep seeing grasshoppers until we have some really nasty conditions. And it's, there's, it's really difficult to predict what's going to happen next year, so we kind of need to have perfect conditions when during egg hatch so they if we're gonna have a bad grasshopper year we need some wet conditions and then and then it has to dry out pretty quickly after that to allow some vegetation to grow and but if it stays wet what during egg hatch and and keeps staying wet for about a you know, few weeks then there's a fungus called nosema that builds up that that will actually kill a lot of the grasshoppers but if we have a, a heavy a heavy rain or wet season followed by dryness, then, then we're going to have another bad grass over here. Yeah, hopefully we have a cold, <laughs> wet spring, <laughs> cold winter and wet spring next year. Yep, that's, that's what we need to hope for. Yeah, that is what we need to hope for. Um, a question came in from Amanda from Bozeman. Um, are there precautions in the percentages of clover and alfalfa hay to feed without harming horses? That's a really great, great question. Um, alfalfa is a pretty standard forage that we feed horses, particularly up here in the northern regions. Um, with clover in there, the biggest thing you have to be careful with is the potential for mold. Mold is ultimately what causes the secondary effects of excess clover consumption. And that mold comes from the clover's ability to dry out. Um, and if the clover doesn't have the ability to dry out, and red clover being particularly one that doesn't dry out very fast, then that mold can present, and your horse will end up with slobbers, um, which is usually the first characteristic sign of some type of mold in your clover. They will literally dump slobber <laughs> on you, which is not pleasant when you are trying to saddle them. Um, but then that can progress into much more serious concerns, being that of bleeding. Um, now, clover is an excellent source of forage. It has great nutrient composition. It is a legume, so it's a little bit higher in the crude protein content, has a nice um, composition of vitamins as well. Um, so it is a high quality source of forage. You just have to be very careful with that presentation of mold. Great. So that brings up another question. Maybe you and Mary can discuss this a little bit. Are there any plant diseases that um, can affect horses? Well, I think mold, the mycotoxigenic molds, um, and there can be a lot of them. Uh, isn't there like a, a, a endophyte in grass that can affect yes. horses? Yes, there is, and that's a really good point. It presents in tall fescue most often. Um, usually it's not an issue in most of our maintenance horses. Where that becomes an issue is in our third trimester pregnant mares as they get closer to that time of parturition and having their foal it can actually cause late-term abortion from that endophyte. Um, and the endophyte is, is basically, it causes abortion in late term, and the mares will sometimes present with what we classically term as a red bag. Um, so the mare may actually go into normal signs of giving birth, um, but as those membranes don't break appropriately of the placenta, then you will actually present with a red bag. Um, and oftentimes the foal doesn't survive that. Uh, they do make endophyte free tall fescue. Um, however, it tends to not be very palatable. So I usually tell most producers to go with a different cool season grass for their pregnant mares um, rather than the, the classic tall season. And then ergot would be the other one I'd probably work. And then I don't know, I don't think that head scab has very much effect on horses or they just don't feed wheat to Yeah, usually we much. don't feed a whole lot of wheat to horses so it doesn't become much of an issue um, because wheat is not highly digestible in our horses so we tend to not use it very much which is why that's not a huge concern. Okay. Um, so Mary, um, a question came in that's a little bit more agronomic but it might be something um, that you have some um, information on. Is it too late to plant winter rye in Austria Austrian field peas as a cover crop? 
That's a great question for probably Perry Miller, okay. our agronomist, um, at, or Pat Carr at Moccasin. Um, right. They'd know the answer to that. And it probably depends on where you are, too. Yeah, absolutely. It would depend on where you are. And also, it's just so hard to predict the weather. You don't know exactly <laughs> you what You need some going. moisture to get them up. So. Uh-huh. Yeah, you sure do. Um, another question um, from Great Falls um, for Abby. They bought willow cuttings last spring, and they did not transplant them. Um, they're wondering what to do with these cuttings so that they don't suffer from winter kill. So they must have planted them in pots. I'm thinking that they planted them in pots and they want to know how to maintain them over the winter. Okay. Um, if they haven't planted them yet, I would probably... So they purchased them last year? Yeah. Okay. It says they bought willow cuttings last spring. So I'm thinking that they must have basically just bought some you know, like the conservation mm -hmm. type trees and, and potted them up. Yeah. Um, I've done the same thing before mm -hmm. <laughs> and carried them yeah. through the winter and yeah. <laughs> not gotten around to doing anything with them. Yeah. So in that case, I would probably wait if, if they are willing to wait another winter before planting them because we could have a, a pretty, um, uh, you know, unpredictable fall um, with uh, a freeze coming anytime. Um, so I would probably uh, keep them in the pots, make sure the pots are big enough so they don't get root bound, um, so that they have uh, enough area in there and then plant it that following spring. Another thing that I've done is just taken them in the pots and then put them kind of like into a bank of soil and get mm -hmm. soil around the roots yeah. because you don't want severe freezing Absolutely. around the roots if yeah. you just left the pot on top of the surface. Mm -hmm. And so. you could use some straw and stuff to help further insulate if you don't have snow. Right, mm -hmm. right. So, okay, great. Um, so, Lori, um, this is from Kalispell. They are experiencing tiny flies with iridescent wings that come out after the first frost. What are they and how do they deal with them? Ooh, I think some people call those actually the little little fairies. <laughs> little fairies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've actually had a couple of calls this week, and, and we have uh, several different types of woolly aphids that, that produce, they, they look like little fairies this time of year. And most of them are going back to their winter host. I've seen them on apple. We also have the leaf curl ash aphid that produces, uh, that has the wing generation going back to the, going back to the ash to overwinter. So at this point, they're just they're just that they will mate and they'll lay eggs, and and that'll be the end of them. But but yeah, we see a huge clump of them kind of trying to move to the trees to overwinter. So yeah, apple, ash, elm, you'll see those on, on all three trees. So so they're cute little, especially cute under the microscope. They look like they look like little yeah they they're blue and fairy like. <laughs> <laughs> so so um, Amanda, a question came in from Missoula. Um, how do you judge the condition of a horse and whether a horse is too fat or too skinny or just right? Sure, that's a really excellent question. And we have a system called the body condition scoring system that was developed by a gentleman by the name of Hineke. And he developed that as a way to assess fat cover by tactile assessment and actually putting our hands on the horse at certain locations that horses tend to deposit fat and that would be over the crest of their neck, right behind their shoulder, along their rib cage, and right on top of their tail head. And it's a scale of one to nine, one being very emaciated, hopefully we don't see many of those horses, um, and nine being what we would consider morbidly obese. And so you can run your hand down those different pieces on the horse's body, so crest of the neck, right behind the shoulder, along the rib cage and on top of their tail head and assign each location a different score and then kind of take the average of that score and you can do it in your head. Um, what would be ideal for a performance horse would be a five, so right there in the middle of that scale. And a nice way to kind of separate and divide that scale into half is a horse that's a body condition score of five or greater you will not be able to see their ribs when they're standing in a normal standing position. If they're below a five, then you will be able to see their rib cages, rib cage and ribs protruding when they're just standing normally. Now with that said, if they're standing kind of funky or turning their head or leaning in one direction, even a horse that's a body condition score of five may show some of that rib. Um, so that's where the tactile assessment really comes in nicely. For our breeding stock, we tend to want them to be a body condition score of six. 
That way they just have a little bit more fat cover to go into that breeding season. Late term gestation and early lactation are very demanding from a nutritional perspective. So if for some reason we're failing to meet those requirements from a nutritional perspective, they have some additional stores that they can pull from. So it's a one to nine scale, five to six being ideal. Okay, great, thank you. So um, Mary, um, this is a question that came in from Lewistown. Um, this spring their garlic cloves were gray and empty and those planted last fall did not do well. Should they get new seed garlic? Uh, yeah, and they probably also want to consider where they have it in their garden. There's a number of storage molds, um, so you probably just don't want to, you know, start with bad seed. Um, start with some nice, healthy cloves. And then crop rotation, I think, is particularly important for a lot of those alliums, all the onions and the garlics. Mm -hmm. um, and I have definitely seen poor performance in mine, and I'm ready to move on. So. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, there's some amazing... Um, garlic varieties out there now. Yeah, my neighbor good. has a, is, I think it's growing it commercially, and has them labeled with these beautiful steaks with all the mm -hmm. names, so I gotta go visit. Yeah, yeah, it's a fun crop to grow. Yeah. So, Abby, um, from Missoula, um, when is the best time to cut back raspberries, and what is the best way to do it? So, um, we have two different types of raspberries that we grow here in Montana. The most common are our June-bearing raspberries, and then the other type are our ever-bearing or fall-bearing raspberries. And for the June-bearing raspberries, anything, any of the floricanes that um, flowered and produced fruit um, this summer, or even if they didn't produce fruit, if they flowered um, this summer, um, those are, are going to die off. So, um, you, can, you can cut those back. Um, or you can wait a little bit later, um, mark them, and as long as you can keep track of which ones um, are the spent uh, floricanes, you can cut those back um, usually a couple inches uh, away from the ground um, any time after they're done um, flowering. For the ever-bearing ones and um, ones if you're not sure what type of raspberries you had or if, if you had um, some frost damage where um, you didn't have um, any of your canes leaf out and you're not sure what's going on, I would wait until um, after the growing season has ended. I like to prune my raspberries in the spring when I'm itching to get out in, into my garden and, and do something. And so um, I'll usually mark the ones that have um, flowered and I'll usually cut them back. And that leaving those canes um, over winter also helps um, provide some habitat for potential beneficial um, organisms as well. So um, keeping track of the ones that have um, flowered and produced fruit um, and you can cut them back anytime after that point. One thing that we've started doing, um, just because the canes tend to grow so tall, mm -hmm. we'll cut everything back to about four, four and a half feet mm -hmm. tall in the fall. Pick it? Well, yeah, so, so you can actually pick it and then you also don't have these tall canes that are getting hammered by snow because yeah. mm -hmm. they'll get so weighted down mm -hmm. and then they're also more wind prone and everything mm -hmm. and that makes it a lot more easier <laughs> or a lot easier to manage when you mm -hmm. actually do go to take the canes out too to just have them topped off a little mm -hmm. bit yeah. yeah mine in the spring all the, the floor canes from the previous year like the bark is peeling and they're, yeah, definitely they're dead. usually mostly dead, dead pretty anyway easily. Yeah. yeah it's easier mm -hmm. to see mm -hmm. yeah, and I've also heard uh, or I've read lots of different recommendations um, but that um, sometimes it is good to wait anyway because sometimes only a percentage of the uh, primo canes will actually survive anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah. yeah, I'm just usually so tired in the fall. I, I know, <laughs> exactly. By the time yes. you've cleaned up the yes. garden, you just don't mm -hmm. want to get on your hands and knees and deal with those things. <laughs> Absolutely. So, um, so a question actually came in for me um, asking, um, is there a directory for seed potatoes in Montana and where they would get one? And we actually do have a directory for um, garden seed potatoes, so a lot of the different specialty varieties. And that can be obtained from our program. Um, you can just call um, me with my contact information or call our office, um, which is 406-994-3150. That will get you to the potato lab. And we also do distribute them to each county and extension, so you can call your county extension agent and get those. Um, if by chance you are com uh, interested in uh, commercial um, quantities of seed potatoes, um, definitely um, give us a call at the same 
um, number at our lab. And um, we also have a website, montanaspud.org. So um, all of our producers and the varieties of potatoes they raise and what they'll have available this year will be on our website. So, so do you have a new favorite yet? You know, um, there's a, a couple of new yellow yellows. So they have yellow flesh and yellow skin. Um, there's a new one called Arizona. Um, our growers are constantly looking to, from an agronomic standpoint, replace Yukon Gold because Yukon Gold is a really, really low yielder, mm. um, especially for the seed producer because it only produces a few tubers and then they get really, really large fast, so it's hard to get a good yield for seed. Um, and there are a lot of potatoes out there that really are just as good as Yukon Gold, but people have, you know, Yukon Gold in their mind, and it's gotten such great consumer, re, um, you know, acceptance that um, that you know people just really, really enjoy it. So, um, but we're trying to educate people that there are really other really good yellow varieties. Another one that's gotten to be pretty popular in Montana and in other areas is Huckleberry Gold, and it has purple skin and yellow flesh, and so mm. that one's also um, you know very good to eat, and you know kind of. Kind of pretty too. So, um, so Lori, it looks like you've got some show and tells. Could you give us a look? Yes, I'm going to start with this one because I think it's taking up everybody's space <laughs> in the studio. So this is uh, we've got, been getting a lot of wasp calls, and uh, this is the, uh, the nest of a bald-faced hornet, and we have also had a lot of western yellow jackets. But uh, but this is this is one that you'll commonly see. And at this time of year, it's this is this is what they look like. They're about the size of a basketball, and this is their their entrance hole right here, entrance and exit hole, and a couple hard frosts will, will actually take care of these, these bald-faced hornets. And what's really pestiferous right now is, is the western yellow jacket. And uh, again, a couple of, of hard frosts will really help take care of those western yellow jackets. But I've, I've seen them up to even 8,000 feet, and, and uh, the nests are actually kind of hard to, hard to see for the, the western yellow jackets. So they will keep foraging until until these hard frosts happen, so we'll see a lot of aggression with them. So I just wanted to also have, a, wanted to mention these traps because a lot of people still have these out, and, and they will, they only trap the western yellow jacket. They don't actually trap the bald-faced hornet. And you do have to replace, there's a lure in here that you have to add, you have to have a, it's a cotton ball, and you add a little bit of the lure to that to try to attract the Western Yellow Jackets. I think you need to do that once a month or change the lure. So you will be able to trap a few here, but, but when you're talking about a Western Yellow Jacket nest that looks a lot like the bald-faced hornet nest, uh, you have hundreds to thousands of, of those wasps, and, and you might be taking care of a little of the population, but, but not really taking care of the, the entire population. So it just makes wait. people feel better, though. It does make you feel better. <laughs> Yeah, so if it makes you feel better, like bring it <laughs> Yeah, and try not to swat at them. It just it just makes them more aggressive. But they're going after a lot of sugary resources right now, and so if they do become pests, uh, pests on your on your porch and things like that, but just wait for a couple hard frosts. When's the best time to set up your western yellow jacket trap? Yeah, so this trap, I would try to get this this out in probably. Uh, I, in Bozeman, I, I, since I live in Bozeman, I try to get mine out by Memorial Day, mm -hmm. and I, it depends on where you live, and maybe a couple weeks before that if you're, if you're in a warmer area, but, but you don't have to get them out too early. But the whole purpose of getting these out is early is to try to trap the queen, so mm -hmm. every queen you trap is, is one less nest that you're going to have. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, great. Amanda, um, a question came in from Kalispell. They have a Norwegian fjord horse that has Cushing's disease. What is the best diet to give that horse? Sure. So a horse with Cushing's disease, uh, Cushing's is also called pars pituitary intermedia dysfunction, which is basically a dysregulation of the pituitary gland and often results in insulin resistance in those horses. So the best thing for a horse that's insulin resistant is to not give them a, a diet that's high in starches and sugars. Um, and so anything that's high in fiber or higher in fats or a forage-based diet is gonna be excellent. Anything to avoid that spike in glucose that you tend to see after a meal, it's going to result in insulin release. The insulin usually no longer has the capability to communicate with the muscle tissue or the liver, liver tissue to actually take in that glucose. And so you can end up with some, some significant metabolic issues that come along with that. So anything for a horse with Cushing's, insulin resistance, um, 
equine metabolic syndrome, anything that's low in starches and sugars, and it may be listed on your feed tag as NSC, which is also known as non-structural carbohydrates. So something lower in that concentration will be fine for that horse. Most Cushing's horses can also do fine just on a hay or pasture only diet as well. So do they ever give horses insulin injections if they have something like Cushing's disease? That's a good question. Not for Cushing's. And most horses never really cross over that threshold from insulin resistance, which is what we would call pre-diabetic. Um, they never really cross over that threshold into being truly diabetic. So usually treating with insulin is, is not necessary. Usually it's managed just dietarily. Um, but there are some other treatments out there for Cushing's, for example, pergolide, um, which is meant to help the adrenal glands and, and stuff to kind of stave off the symptoms associated with that disease. Um, but there's nothing from a insulin regulatory perspective to give, but the pergolide is usually something that your veterinarian would, would prescribe for a horse with Cushing's. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, from Whitefish, Mary, um, these folks have tomatoes in a hoop house and they've got black spots on both the leaves and the fruit. Do you have an idea what might be causing the black spots? It can be a number of things. It could be a fungal disease. If it's only the tip of the tomato, it's, it's usually helping out the calcium deficiency. Love Boss, the rot. Boss, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> if, if there's small spots, I mean, there's bacterial ultimary, speck, yeah. but I wouldn't expect that to come in a hoop house because you usually wouldn't have a lot of foliar watering. But seed transmitted, so. Yeah, it could, yeah, it could be yeah. bacteria. I used, to, I used to have an heirloom variety. They'd get that all the time, and I'd bring it into Egg Live every year because it yeah. relied upon. Okay. But that would be um, kind of small spots and then cut with a yellow halo around them. Mm -hmm. And we can certainly just um, diagnose it in the clinic. Yeah, that would be great if, if you still, if these folks still have some uh, of those yeah. leaves, send them into the clinic because um, if it is caused by a pathogen, you can usually tease it out yeah. and, and, and yeah, see it's not, not hard to eat or anything, but if you're right. trying to sell it, then um, right. people don't want it. Right, and, uh, and it can, you know, it can uh, decrease the amount of time that you can store the potatoes or the tomatoes. Yeah. And if <laughs> everything's about potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> They're so anxious. It's all yeah, right. yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, it would be good to get to the bottom of it. And also, um, many of the varieties are resistant to plant diseases. So if it's yep. something that you think could be a problem in the future, just look for a variety that, that has resistance to that. So, Abby, another question from Whitefish. Um, what is the best lawn fertilizer to use? Um, there, are, there are lots of lawn fertilizers. You generally want to aim for about um, a certain amount of, you want to aim for about one pound of nitrogen per thousand um, uh, square feet about three or four times a year depending on how often you get around to it. That most important time of year again being the fall fertilizing. So any sort of fertilizer that has that one pound of actual nitrogen per thousand square feet um, on there um, is going to be great for a lawn fertilizer. So that's kind of the number that you're aiming for. Great. Okay. So um, for Lori, um, a question about cabbages and other coal crops. Um, this person has had problems with um, the um, cabbage worms. Um, they're wondering about BT products that they might be able to use for controlling those and if they're effective and how you use them. Yeah, they're effective. Uh, they're BT products, uh, BT stands for Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a bacterium, and it's specific. They have a strain that's specific to caterpillars, the Kerstaki strain, and which are, you could easily get at, at Home Depot or, or, or Ace, uh, any of the local stores. And they're best controlled in the earlier stages, the instars, the earlier instars of the caterpillars. So once they've, once they uh, bef reach the, the later instars, they're a little bit harder to control. So once you start seeing them, do a little scouting, and, and once you start seeing the caterpillars being active, that's the best time to control them. And, and you have to apply it repeatedly. So if it rains or you irrigate, you have to apply it again. Um, and that can be the hardest thing to keep up with. Yeah, yeah, and contact is, is critical. So if you're not reaching them with the, with the BT, then it's not gonna work. When, so when my cats start going after the white moths, that's when I know that <laughs> <laughs> it's time to get the BT yeah, out. Yeah. <laughs> see, yeah. see, they look pretty when they're flying around, but that's a sign mm -hmm. when you've got a white, white butterfly flying around that, that you've probably got the, uh, the cabbage moth, yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, thank you. From Florence for Amanda. Um, I guess since we're talking about gardens, um, what can you feed your horse from a vegetable garden? Um, 
are there any vegetables that maybe shouldn't be fed? That would be a, a good first part of the question. And then also they have bindweed wrapping around their pole beans that they wanted to feed them. I'm wondering if that's a good idea or not. Sure, so I tend to, to steer away from feeding horses most things from the garden. Obviously carrots are our safe option and horses love them. Uh, but I tend to tell people to steer away from feeding them much out of their garden simply because you're going to throw off their dietary balance. But also if you, if you start feeding them in excess out of the garden, you're giving them bundles of carrots a day, um, then you can actually end up with some digestive upset. So we really want to be careful doing much of that. A little carrot treat here or there is great. Um, carrots are nice because they have quite a bit of vitamin A in them and they don't have a lot of sugars but a lot of things that come out of our garden are pretty high in sugars and that's not usually something that we want to give to our horses but that's why they really like it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, apples are, are great, horses love them but they're also very high in sugars so you just have to be, be quite careful. Um, now as far as the, the weed that's wrapping around most horses, as long as they have something else to graze on, a, a high quality forage or pasture, then they're usually going to stay away from those various types of weeds. Um, I'm not familiar with that specific weed, but Hayes Goosey is our forage extension specialist with the Department of Animal and Range Science, and he'd be a great person that could potentially answer that question for you. Okay. Okay, great. Um, for Mary, um, another garden question um, from Helena. Uh, what can they do to prevent powdery mildew in their squash? Oh, it, that's hard. Um, if you are growing it from seed, or sometimes the seed, the labels at the garden center have a little PM, mm -hmm. and that means it's resistant to powdery mildew. I don't know of any off the top of my head that are super resistant. Um, mm -hmm. It was interesting. This year I hardly got any powdery mildew in my squash, and I do choose varieties that do say they have some powdery mildew re resistance. And I don't know if I just did a better job of <laughs> selecting varieties or... It was kind of hot this it year was too. hot this year. I'm, yeah. Yeah. I didn't have a horrible issue this year. Um, but you can also, you know, like if you don't overhead water, that'll help um, do some cultural management, crop rotation, um, although I don't, I don't know how effective that is. Yeah, um, in, a, in a garden situation that's yeah. usually... And then really like, I guess there are probably some copper sprays they may have. And it's really I'm kind of tired of the squash yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. or, or actually you want the canopy to open up and kind of force it to ripen yeah. a little bit so I don't know that it's always such a bad thing yeah, so. yeah. but I have seen it be pretty serious so um, from Great Falls Abby um, they have an amaryllis bulb that's five years old it's bloomed four out of five years this year it did not it is long and leafy and really healthy but it has no bloom what the, what should they do to rest it this year for blooming that's uh, hard to say if it's, um, you know, if it's been productive for the past few years, um, one thing that they might need to do is, is uh, make sure that the soil has enough nutrients that would uh, encourage that to bloom again. So a soil test would probably be a good idea. Um, and uh, there are resources that you can find that talk more about forcing um, blooms as well. Um, so uh, if, if they have questions, they could um, look at uh, extension resources that talk about how to force that, um, that bulb to flower. But generally what I would do is if, if something's been productive for a few years and, you know, reduces that productivity is to, to make sure that those soil nutrients are sufficient to meet those needs for flowering. Okay, great. Okay, um, Lori um, from Billings. Um, this person is wondering, do we have spotted lanternflies here? We do not have the spotted lanternfly here yet. And this is actually brought a spotted lanternfly with me today, a sample of this. We have had a couple of close calls or had some people actually call in some questions about spotted lanternfly recently. And it is a pest that we're, we're really scouting for. It did make its way to Kansas in a student's insect collection at the <laughs> state fair. So we don't know. It's, it's one of those insects that's it's, it's from China, and we, it probably will make it here at some point. And it's an excellent hitchhiker. It, it looks and lay eggs on almost anything. But we're kind of scouting for it and worried about it for we've got hops, and we've got some grapes and apples. And it has a very
very wide host range and can cause quite a bit of damage. So we are looking out for that, but, but no, we have not found it yet. And if you have any suspected samples, you can contact your local extension agent or you can send me pictures or samples to the Scudder Diagnostic Lab. Okay, great. Um, so Amanda, a caller from Belt has a seven-year-old mare that really won't take to being bred, and she has a crested neck. Do you have any ideas to help her out on this? Um, first of all, can you tell us what a crested neck is, and then second of all, what that might mean in terms of ability to breed? Sure. Usually when people refer to a crested neck, they're talking about a, a large deposition of fat on the top line of their neck that actually creates this crest-like appearance. Um, as far as her inability to get bred, it could potentially be because she is overweight. If we get beyond that body condition score of six to upwards of, a, of an eight plus, then reproductive efficiency tends to go down. Um, but with that said, it, that may not be associated with her body condition. It may be a breeding soundness issue. So I would definitely contact your veterinarian and have them do a breeding soundness exam on that mare, which typically encompasses ultrasound, potentially uterine biopsies, to determine if there's anything from a reproductive standpoint that may be preventing her from, from taking and getting bred. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so, Mary, I know you're the wheat streak mosaic expert in the state, so uh, with the type of harvest we had, with the weather we're having right now, um, what do you think the outlook is for wheat streak mosaic um, developing this fall and into next spring? Pretty dismal for the virus and the mite. Um, <laughs> That's good. That's one silver lining in this. Right. Drought is not good for most plant diseases and wheat streak. We did get, I think, a sample or two into the clinic, but... Um, there, there are exceptions to the rule, mm -hmm. for sure. And once we have, you know, disease shut down by drought like it is now, it, we'd need a two, three years of moisture to really get any sort of significant disease going. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's see. Um, so, Abby, um, this is a caller from Bozeman. They have a young apple tree that had slit bark over the last winter. Um, is there something that they can do to protect that from happening again this year? Yeah, so um, some of our tender or thin bark woody ornamentals um, have this injury that's called southwest injury or winter injury where it's usually on that side of the bark that is exposed to that sunlight and when you have warm sunny days in the winter um, then you start to have that splitting of the bark because um, that moisture is going to um, start to move around in, in that tree. Um, and so one way that you can reduce the likelihood of that happening or prevent it is you can use tree wraps around the base, um, ar around that trunk, um, or you can also use tree paints, um, uh, latex-based tree paints that you can apply. That'll reduce that likelihood of that, um, that damage that could potentially kill your tree if it's extensive enough. Okay, great. So, so I was in Utah this week and they had beaver damage on a lot of the plants. And what they did was they mixed sand with latex paint. Oh. And put, so is that good for like voles and stuff too, or? I don't know. Um, that would that might be a really good question for Jared Beaver, our invertebrate <laughs> specialist. But yeah, I don't know. I've never heard of that. Yeah, they were That's painting the trees they wanted to save with latex paint mixed with sand. Interesting. Yeah. Huh. yeah. So Lori. A call came in from Missoula, and um, so they are bugged, and they specifically say, no <laughs> pun intended, <laughs> by earwigs in their corn, in their apricots. I specifically get very bugged about having them in my dahlias. Um, what can they do about earwigs? You can do a couple things for earwigs. I, mostly you want to give them a place to, to hide other than your dahlias and, and your corn in some corrugated cardboard that's wettened a little bit, kind of damp, kind of put that in the soil next to the plants. Or you could do kind of a rolled up newspaper, something similar to that. And, and then you could kind of make your own bait. And you could, you could use like a, a tuna can or something like that with some, uh, some oil and, and they will actually fall into that, that trap if you put it kind of at soil line. So those, those are, again, there's no silver bullet, but I mean, they do have a, a beneficial role too. So they, they feed on soft body things like insects, but, but getting rid of earwigs is, is very challenging. Anything you can do to kind of uh, 
reduce the moisture around your plants, but giving a place to hide is probably one of your best best ways to get rid of them, but it's not gonna take care of them completely. I used to get them bad, really bad in my lettuce, but then I thinned like every other lettuce plant to just try and open up that and reduce the moisture, and that helped a lot. Air it out a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Amanda, um, we have a caller from Townsend um, who is having trouble obtaining hay this year. And uh, <laughs> they normally feed straight grass and um, just a small amount of a oat supplement. It's a young horse. And um, they're wondering, um, this year, um, the only hay that they've been able to source is straight alfalfa. So what do they need to do to adjust their, their feeding plan with straight alfalfa when they've normally been fe feeding hay in the winter? or excuse me, grass hay in the winter? That's a very relevant question <laughs> for right now in the drought. Um, it is hard to get hay right now, and that's a, that's a big challenge. If you're switching from an all grass hay to an alfalfa hay, if you haven't made that transition yet, make that transition slowly. Kind of mix that alfalfa with the grass hay that you're running out of. Um, so that the horses can transition to that a little bit more easily. Grass hay does have a different nutrient composition than most of our legume hays. Um, the legumes tend to be a little bit more nutrient dense, so we want the GI to be able to adapt to that change in diet over time. Um, but if you are in a situation where you don't think you're going to have enough long stem forage in the form of baled alfalfa or baled grass hay to get you through the winter, the minimum long stem forage requirement for horses is 1% of their body weight per day. So for an 1,000 pound horse, that would be about 10 pounds per day. Now with that said, that 10 pounds of forage is not necessarily gonna meet their nutrient requirements. However, you can fill that gap with hay cubes or alfalfa cubes that you can soak or something along those lines that can buffer that and maybe add in a, a commercially a formulated grain ration, concentrate feed. There are some great options out there. There's even some products called balancers um, or forage balancers. You'll also hear them called ration balancers that tend to be higher in protein, vitamins, and minerals. Because usually um, if we're feeding an all forage diet to horses, then those can tend sometimes be deficient if we have to cut back on the amount that we're feeding them. And those are usually supplements that only need to be fed at about one to two pounds per day. So, so very low amounts. But as long as you're meeting that 1% body weight per day in long stem forage, you can typically fill the gap of their nutrient requirements with something else to try and conserve some of that long stem forage during a drought year. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so Mary, a great follow-up question on the powdery mildew powdery mildew on squash. Um, this uh, grower from Hot Springs is wondering um, if neem oil is beneficial for powdery mildew. I don't know that off the top of my head. I have to check the label. I think it is actually labeled for powdery mildew, but I've never used it. I've yeah, never I used neem oil for anything. And that's so. another one you probably have to repeatedly, if it, if, if it is on the label for powdery mildew, then repeatedly applying it. Right. And then also check for phytotoxicity before you spray it over Absolutely. everything. Absolutely, yeah. So check it on a, a leaf or two, so make sure it doesn't burn the plant. And don't spray when it's 95 right. right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, any product that says oil in it, definitely yeah. do not spray in the sunny heat of the day. So, um, so Abby, a question from Boulder. Um, they noticed that there were several different types of plants for sale outside of a store while they were in Bozeman. Some were ornamental kales, and there were some succulents. Would you recommend buying and planting these now or keep them in the house from this point on? For the ornamental kales, I wouldn't uh, plant them now. Um, those are probably going to be better kept inside the house. For the succulents, um, I w it would depend on what type of succulent it is, but depending on um, you know when your um, uh, first frost date is predicted or kind of what your weather is doing, I would probably err on the side of being cautious to, to keep them inside and then plant them the following year um, if just in case there wouldn't be enough time for those plants to, um, to become established and harden off before the, before the cold mm -hmm. comes in. Yeah, and I think with ornamentals, it's kind of always, what is your expectation? Mm -hmm. You know, what kind of bang do you want for your buck? Mm -hmm. <laughs> At this point, we could have another two weeks or we could have another month. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. Yeah. 
hard to know. Um, so Lori, um, does the western yellow jacket hibernate in the nest and or do they return the following year? For example, if I have um, yellow jackets in my soffits now, will they return the next year? That's a really great question, and the answer is no. They, will, they abandon their nest every year, so the queens now should be going to their overwintering sites if they have not already. So they will abandon that nest, and, and the workers will survive for a little bit longer until they run out of resources. And then they, they might choose a nest close by, but it is, uh, they will not return to that same nest, so that uh, all the workers will eventually die within there. So very good question, and they will pick another location for sure. Okay. Okay, um, Amanda, a call that came, or yeah, that came in um, from Callis Spell. Um, they're wondering about how often a stabled horse should be fed in the winter. So they've heard, you know, some of their cohorts talking about feeding their horses snacks, <laughs> and they're wondering <laughs> um, how often does a horse really need to be fed if they're stabled? Sure. Um, one thing that we have done as a as a human society is is train horses to be housed inside. And we can manage that, certainly, but it, it does take a little bit more of a laborious <laughs> type circumstance. Um, but with that said, we want to try and mimic natural horse feeding behavior as much as we can, even if they're housed inside. And most of what that looks like is giving that horse enough forage, enough long stem hay to be able to make it from the time that you leave that day to the time that you're going to come back at the next bout. Horses are designed to be constant grazers. So they don't actually have the shutoff system in their stomach to turn off hydrochloric acid production. So if they go extended amounts of time without having the ability to graze and eat on something, then that's when you see digestive disorders present, such as gastric ulcers, even colic sometimes. You'll really see some behavioral issues and bad habits pop up if horses aren't able to maintain that natural feeding behavior. You'll see them start weaving in the stalls where they just rock back and forth on their front end. Um, they'll learn to crib, which is where they actually bite on with their top teeth to something and pull back and they'll actually take in air into their um, esophagus and windpipe, which sends an endorphin response. Um, so there's a number of, of, of issues that can come with not properly feeding maintaining feeding management through housing horses inside. As long as they have constant access to forage, then the decision of how you feed them their grain meals ultimately comes from how much you're feeding them, and how much they, they require. Um, the stomach in a horse is actually fairly small relative to most monogastrics. So a general rule is anything that's greater than five pounds shouldn't be fed in a meal. Um, and forage doesn't fall into that. That's just a concentrate meal that they're going to stand there and consume all in one bout because it's so yummy. Um, so anything greater than five pounds needs to be split into two different feedings, hopefully equal, equally apart, 7 a.m., 7 p.m. Obviously, that's not always realistic for us and our schedules, but as, as close to that as we can get. And the biggest thing is just staying consistent. If you normally feed at 7 a.m., try to always feed at 7 a.m., um, when horses start to anticipate and have to wait, then you can get some gastric upset issues that result from that and, and some pretty expansive behavioral issues too. So feeding management is really important. Always have hay. Okay, great. Thank you, Amanda. Um, Mary, after a drought, do we need seed treatments next spring? Uh, yes, I always mm -hmm. recommend seed treatments. Um, even though you didn't observe a lot of disease issues, um, if we get a wet spring, don't worry, Pythium and Aphanomyces are still there waiting. Um, this year, I think we've had a lot of fusarium build up in the soil because it likes those extreme temperatures and moisture fluctuations. So yes, the diseases are always there. Okay, great. Yes, ready to pounce. <laughs> so Amanda, we're getting towards the end. Um, could you just take about a minute and cover anything that we either didn't get to or something that you would like to tell us about your program? Sure, I think the biggest take home with managing any horse herd or even single horses is to keep it as simple as you can and keep forage the main piece of that horse's management scheme. If they have constant access to forage or, or consistent access to forage, 
then you're going to have an overall healthier horse. The GI is hugely important to overall horse health. And if we can keep those horses eating forage, then that, that's ideal. And of course, that's challenging this year with the, the level of drought that we have. Um, so if you are having to change your horse's diet to, to adapt to that drought scenario, just do that slowly. General rule is about seven to 10 days. Um, to transition them to that diet, and then they won't actually metabolically adapt for about another 21 days. So, so just take your time and be patient in that transition. Um, as far as, as my program goes, we're always looking for horses to be donated to Montana State's program, whether that be horses for the equitation program, um, so show horses that may not be showing at the same capacity as they were, or even if you have brood mares that you're looking to rehome, and uh, we're always open to that, so please give us a call. Uh, my number is 406-994-7689, and would be happy to talk to you about that. Okay, thank you, Amanda, that was so interesting. Um, Thank you, panel, for being here tonight. Thank you, our sponsors. And next week, uh, Dr. John Dudley will be talking to us about school safety. So see you next Sunday. For more information and resources, visit montanapbs.org slash ag live. Montana Ag Live is made possible by the Montana Department of Agriculture, the MSU Extension Service, the MSU Ag Experiment Stations of the College of Agriculture.